During the course of being an historian, I have written about a dozen books that have dealt with various aspects of the war against Japan, and in particular Japanese war crimes. It is a fair comment to say that the World War II Japanese Imperial forces plumb the very depths of depravity in their treatment of Allied POWs, civilian internees, and the populations of territories that it conquered. Many of these crimes completely forgotten today. I recently came upon some files from the Tokyo war crimes trial that have never been published or even examined by historians since they were filed away in 1946. The detail a crime so horrific that it almost beggars belief. The files are witness testimonies from Indian Army survivors of Japanese prison camps, who detailed the truly shocking truth that in certain places the Japanese army turned cannibal, eating Indian prisoners, a methodical and planned crime that resulted in hundreds of deaths. This is that story. The British Indian Army fought steadfastly and bravely through two world wars. Its regiments had long and fine traditions dating back almost two hundred years, traditions that have carried over into the modern post-independence Indian and Pakistani armies. Its soldiers were not slaves of the British, as it is sometimes fashionable to call them today, but well-trained and motivated fighting men who earned stellar reputations for bravery, professionalism, and determination in numerous World War II campaigns, from the deserts of North Africa to the mountains of Italy to the jungles of Burma. Recruited mainly from the martial classes of the Indian subcontinent, two million Indians served in the army during World War II. The two largest religious groupings were Hindus at 50 percent and Muslims at 34 percent. Without their service and their fighting spirit, Britain could not have been successful, particularly in the tough Burma campaign against the Japanese, when seven out of ten British soldiers were actually Indians. Indian regiments were led by a mixture of British and Indian officers. The British officers able to speak the languages of their soldiers. In the infantry brigades, British and Indian battalions would serve alongside each other, and a bond of trust and respect existed between the battalions as they fought together against the common enemy. Alongside the Indians served another 150,000 Gurkhas from Nepal, all volunteers. Out of 182 Victoria Crosses awarded in World War II, 31 went to Indian or Gurkha soldiers or their attached British officers. Unfortunately, British military defeats early in the war in Malaya, Singapore, and Burma saw tens of thousands of Indian soldiers, along with their British officers, become prisoners of the Japanese. Indians were treated as barbarously by the Japanese as they treated European prisoners, and in some cases much worse. Bizarrely, at the same time as they abused Indians, the Japanese also sought to recruit them to their cause to fight against the British into an organization later called the Indian National Army. Some of the worst abuse handed out to Indian troops came to those who were captured on the island of Borneo. When the Japanese captured the British colony of Sarawak in northern Borneo on the 27th of December 1941, most of their new prisoners were Indian troops from the 2nd 15th Punjab Regiment, led by a handful of British officers. Imperial General Headquarters in Tokyo decreed that Indian troops would be reduced to coolies for the emperor and worked to death alongside their erstwhile white masters. They were numerous, fit, and acclimatized to conditions in the Far East, and in some ways better equipped to deal with the rigors of Japanese imprisonment than white soldiers. However, there was also some ambivalence in the treatment of Indian prisoners by the Japanese, for the Japanese always argued that the war they had begun was a war to liberate the oppressed peoples of Asia from the yoke of white imperial domination. In one of their wilder flights of propaganda fantasy, they had even taken to describing their new empire as the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere.
The Kempe Thai military police, who were also charged with propaganda campaigns against the Allies, argued persuasively that the Indian troops were essentially an oppressed people, who could probably be turned away from their allegiance to the British King Emperor. The degree of sympathy with the aims of the Indian National Congress and leaders like Mohandas Gandhi, who demanded independence from Britain, could be exploited by the Japanese for their own ends. In Tokyo, an Indian independence leader named Subhas Chandra Bose had been trying to persuade the Japanese to allow him to create an Indian National Army recruited directly from the prison camps. The Japanese never managed to get over their deep distrust and suspicion of all foreigners to make Bose's enterprise more successful than it was, and their attitude towards Indian POWs remained complex. Quote, Japan's educational system indoctrinated its youth, many of whom were later conscripted, in the belief that they were superior people destined to rule over the lesser nationalities of Asia. The darker one's skin, the lower one's status. End quote. Indian soldiers were quickly separated from their white officers and actively courted into fighting against their former masters. But the loyalty of most Indian soldiers to their regiments and the Allied war effort meant that Japanese efforts to subvert these men were often unsuccessful, and they were necessarily accompanied by the usual disgusting acts of Japanese brutality towards Indians that further alienated the two Asian peoples from one another. Corporal Changdi Ram was captured alongside 212 of his comrades from the 2nd 15th Punjab Regiment at Kuching on the 27th of December 1941. The Indian prisoners spent two months at Kuching working on an airfield for the Japanese, and they were regularly abused by their guards. Implements included rifle butts, sticks, steel rods and boots. Ram recalled trying to help white prisoners, quote, some Australian and British prisoners were kept in the adjoining cell, and we were beaten for giving them food. End quote. Later, Ram and his fellow prisoners were moved to a camp at Seria for a year. Quote, we were given bad rice mixed with lime in Seria, recalled Ram. At that time, we were not used to eating rice and became weak. Those of us who were unable to work were beaten, and those who could not carry heavy loads were also beaten. End quote. The Indian prisoners were later transferred to a camp at Koala Balait, a small town in Brunei, where they were incarcerated until June 1945, under the command of a Lieutenant Yamaguchi. Quote, at Syria and Koala Balait, the prisoners were compelled to work, and if too weak to do so, were beaten. Ram had his teeth knocked out and his collarbone broken as a result of one of these beatings. Others were beaten into unconsciousness, and some died as a result of being beaten. End quote. Ram recalled the beatings that he suffered. I was beaten with a leather belt, and the Jap also took off a boot and beat me across the face with it. Other Indian troops had been captured at the fall of Singapore on the 15th of February 1942, and later shipped into Borneo as slave labour alongside British and Australian prisoners. Corporal Partip Singh, the 17th Field Company Indian Engineers, was one such unfortunate. He was sent to Lutong Camp in May 1942. Once again, they, quote, were made to work and were beaten with sticks, steel bars and wire pliers, end quote. In May 1943, 70 of these prisoners were sent to another camp nine miles away at the town of Miri. There, the Japanese tried to get the Indians to join the Indian National Army, the INA, a renegade Japanese-sponsored puppet military force of disaffected Indian soldiers and outright nationalists later sent to fight against the British on the Burma Front. Corporal Singh was among those sent to Miri, where the Japanese worked them hard before indoctrination began. If their intention was to entice Indian soldiers over to the Japanese side, their treatment of Indian prisoners proved to be a rather large disincentive. Quote, the Indians were put to work loading and unloading ships for nine hours a day, details war crimes documents. They were beaten as before. On one occasion, Singh couldn't walk for a month as a result of a beating. He was sick with dysentery, beriberi and malaria, end quote. Corporal Changdi Ram recalled that at Koala Belait, quote, Indian officers were put in charge of Indian work parties, 
I was beaten many times there with sticks and bits of steel pipe. At first we were given enough rice and vegetables, but when we refused to help them against the British, the Japanese reduced our rations. End quote. Two renegade Indians came to the camp and lectured the prisoners about Indian independence and exhorted them to join the INA, but according to Ram, quote, this had no result and the two Indians went away again. The Japs reduced the rations more and we got just a handful of rice a day, end quote. Corporal Patip Singh recalled in his testimony that, quote, we told the Japanese that we would work under them but we would not join the Indian National Army, end quote. The Japanese then tried to force the Indians to learn Japanese. Quote, we had to count, and when we forgot the numbers, we were beaten, said Ram. In one month at Koala Belait, 55 Indian prisoners died of starvation. Quote, about the 13th or 14th of June 1945, the Indians were ordered to fall in and were then bayoneted or beheaded by the Japanese. End quote. Ram escaped by hiding in some bushes. Quote, I did not actually see the killing, recalled Ram, but I heard the Indians crying, and in the morning I went in and saw that all of the Indians' heads had been cut off. Sixty-five Indian soldiers were thus executed. One incident recounted by Corporal Ram highlighted how important the issue of face was to the Japanese. The Japanese used to make the Indian prisoners guard themselves at night by issuing one of the NCOs with a wooden rifle. Some refused this duty and were beaten, including Ram. One night when Ram was being assaulted, quote, an Indian officer came and asked the Japanese why they were beating the Indians, pointing out that this should not be done. Temporarily, the beatings were stopped, end quote. The Japanese guard, Private Atada, had lost face in front of the Indian officer, and so determined to restore his face by once more finding an excuse to assault prisoners. He ordered the Indians to light a fire in their barracks one night, soon after, to drive away mosquitoes. Later, Atara marched into the barracks and demanded to know who had lit a fire without his permission. Quote, he called five Indian officers and six other ranks and beat them with a steel pipe. Then the party was taken to the military police, the Kempe Tai, and beaten again until they fell unconscious. They were badly injured. End quote. The Kempe Tai, quote, beat them with cane sticks. Cold water was poured over the men to restore them when, again, they were beaten, stated Ram. After 13 days, four other ranks were brought back to the camp. Atada was well known among the prisoners for his sadism. He often accused the prisoners of signalling to Allied aircraft and would beat prisoners accordingly. Lieutenant Yamaguchi, the commandant, ordered his NCOs to beat all of the Indians regularly, seeming to believe that this abuse would make them slave harder. The abuse continued unremittingly for years as Indian soldiers were shipped about from camp to camp and the Kempei Tai made some desultory efforts to convert them to the Japanese war effort. One of the most disturbing events of the whole war occurred to Corporal Ram and his Indian comrades while they were imprisoned in New Guinea. Without any warning, the Japanese began a program of cannibalization of their Indian prisoners. Ram first witnessed an incident of cannibalism on the 12th of November 1944, when a Kempe Thai officer beheaded a recently captured Allied pilot. I saw this from behind a tree, recalled Ram, who then witnessed an appalling act of butchery take place as the Japanese soldiers present began to render the young pilot's body into food. Ram, quote, watched some of the Japanese cut flesh from his arms, legs, hips, buttocks, and carry it off to their quarters. They cut it in small pieces and fried it, Ram recalling the smell of human flesh cooking as it wafted over the emaciated and starving Indian POWs. Worse was to come. Lance Corporal Hatam Ali stated to war crimes investigators that the Japanese turned to eating Indian POWs to supplement their meagre rations. Quote, the Japanese started selecting prisoners, and every day one prisoner was taken out and killed and eaten by the soldiers. I personally saw this happen, and about 100 prisoners were eaten at this place by the Japanese. End quote. Worse was to come. Quote, the remainder of us were taken to another spot 50 miles away, where 10 prisoners died of sickness. At this place, the Japanese again started selecting prisoners to eat, 
Those selected were taken to a hut where their flesh was cut from their bodies while they were alive, and they were thrown into a ditch where they later died. End quote. That any of the Indians survived such an appalling treatment was nothing short of a miracle, but those that did were able to contribute to the International War Crimes Tribunal in Tokyo, and some of those responsible for these horrendous crimes were indeed punished by the British after the war. But it is also true that as Indian independence came less than two years after the end of the war and whilst war crimes trials were still in operation, much of the Indian testimony and the suffering they had suffered was forgotten. It is also something that appears to be not widely known in India and Pakistan today, and has also been largely forgotten by the British. But I think that to acknowledge the suffering of Indian troops alongside British, American, Australian and Dutch forces in Southeast Asia is important, and should always be remembered. Many thanks for listening. Please subscribe and share, and visit my video channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. Thank you.